I suppose at this stage I ought to ask you the question that can never be answered. If you can't hear, put your hand up. Think about that. Because I usually sit there straining to hear, but I trust that you can all hear. Despite the many and varied suggestions of theologians, ever since the days of the early Christian faith, we cannot be certain for whom and by whom the book of Hebrews was written. Theories and suggestions abound. We're not here to speculate we're not here to add further ideas. We're just going to look at what the scripture has to say. Now, unlike some of the New Testament writers, Paul, for example, Peter and James, there's no usual introduction, no greeting, no beginning of saying who the writer is or even why they're writing. And even Hebrews is, is, is thought to have been added as a title not until the second century. So if that's the case, uh, do we really know who wrote the book, to whom it was written, and does it even matter? Well, yes, of course. And we do know that it matters, even if we don't know who wrote it. It is part of the inspired canon of Scripture. But a careful study of the book of Hebrews will give us many clues that Hebrews was written to a hard-pressed, beleaguered group of Jewish Christians people who had recognised what Paul says when he wrote his letter to the church in Galatia, that the law was a schoolmaster to bring them to God. Years ago, I, was, um, I used to travel regularly from New York to London on, on what was known as the Friday Night Red Eye Special. It left, left, left New York at something like 7 o'clock in the evening and we arrived in London the following morning. And I remember on one occasion being uh, sitting next to a young Orthodox Jew. He must have been in his 20s or 30s. He had his big hat, so he took up much more room in the locker up at the top where we used to put our cases. Uh, but then he spent the whole of the, what is it, six or hours with his head absolutely devoted to the Word of God. He never stopped. I, I had a conversation with him, but I was reluctant to speak to him because I know he was so intent on the Word and when I did speak to him, I, I inquired a little bit about background. I could see he was an Orthodox Jew. And it turned out that, in fact, he was training to be a rabbi. And we talked a little bit, and uh, I, I talked about the Old Testament. He didn't want to know. His only interest was in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, and in the law. That was what he was being trained to learn and to teach. And there's a sense in which, at the time of the book of Hebrews, that was what was the background that these believers had come out from Judaism and had embraced the Christian faith. But they were under great opposition. They were under opposition from the Roman authorities who pressurized them to conform to the worship of the Roman emperor. It pervaded society. 
And throughout that part of, of what we now refer to as the Middle East, there were temples in varying cities to the emperor. And they were expected to do their dues. I remember going some um, years ago, I was on business in, um, in Japan. And we were going to a very large Japanese company. And uh, as we went, uh, we, 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 we had an agent in the office there in Japan. And he took us into uh, the company. And we went via the shrine. And for those who felt able to, they went and bowed in the shrine. I wasn't prepared to, to bow in the shrine to go in the company. There was, there was pressure there for me to conform. And there was pressure here in the time that Hebrews was written to conform to the requirements of, of the Roman authorities. But then there were pressures for these Christians uh, from their families. They had perhaps come to know and accept the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by turning from Judaism uh, to the gospel of grace. And there would be pressure on them from their families, from their acquaintances, on their businesses, because they had stepped aside and they had accepted Christ as saviour. And so the writer is anxious to address the issues which these early Christians were facing. And the call of Hebrews was to stand firm in Christ Jesus, not just in the law, but they were never encouraged to disobey the law, but the law was insufficient. It was a schoolmaster to lead them to God. And so to do this, the writer begins the letter by reminding the Jewish Christians of the superiority of Jesus Christ. Now, we, we must not forget, uh, as we move through these verses, that it was to Jewish Christians that he was... Oh, the person was writing. There are other places, of course, in the New Testament, particularly with the Apostle Paul, where he was quite clearly uh, not speaking, or speaking not to a Jewish audience. Think of his time when he was in Athens. He didn't refer to the law then. He referred to the Greek uh, uh, um, poets, uh, 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 and the wise men of the day, and it was from there that he built his bridge to introduce Christ. Whereas here, it's from the scriptures. And so, uh, we can think of the book of Hebrews in two halves. In chapters 1 to 10, <clears throat> we read about the superiority of Christ Jesus. And in the remaining chapters, we have the call to worship, to faith, and to perseverance. And although it was written to Jewish believers, there are no reason why we should not apply it to ourselves today. So let's just look at some of the thoughts that are brought out in these early chapters. And let me leave you with a text, if I may. Uh, if all else is forgotten tonight, think of the text. Chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Therefore, holy brothers, uh, and I'm taking the liberty of saying holy sisters as well, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. That's the thrust of these opening chapters in Hebrews that we fix our eyes 
on Christ Jesus. There are four ways in which the writer <coughs> shows us the greatness of the Lord Jesus. He's greater than the prophets. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. And he is greater than Aaron. If you've got your Bibles open, let's just read those verses again. Chapter 1 and verse 1. In the past... God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days has spoken to us by his son. I, I love that first verse of Hebrews. I think it's just a wonderful example of God's patience and of God's grace. Throughout the years, the hundreds of years, he has spoken to them by the prophets in different ways, some quite creative ways, as we shall look at in a minute. God was a God of patience and a God of grace. Now, the scriptures don't actually say in the text that Christ was superior to the prophets but if anyone would like to take me on and on that come and speak to me afterwards and show me how he wasn't because we know of course that he was why because he was the very fulfillment of the prophet's message right from the early days You know, I, I love going to orchestral concerts. I, uh, I go regularly to the ones in Amersham through the winter. And um, the opening verses of Hebrews remind us of an overture as a symphony starts. It's a preview of the wonders of what is going to come. And as each part of a symphony unfolds, if you've got an ear for music, you will be able to relate it to the overture. Hebrews begins and reminds us in verse 3 that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, Saint Anthony, an early Christian, no relation of mine, of course, um, was a monk who lived a very godly life, uh, and so much so that the emperors were said to write to him. His fellow monks could hardly believe that he got letters or correspondence from the emperors. And Antony's response to his fellow monks was, do not be astonished if an emperor writes to us, for he is a man. But rather wonder that God wrote the law for men and has spoken to us through his son. God spoke via the prophets. Spoke in some very unusual ways, didn't he? Now, uh, think of Balaam. Quite an extraordinary story, wasn't it? Where he used an animal to speak and to bring his message um, to Israel. Uh, God also wrote. And there's a study for you Bible students how many times in the Bible can you find that God wrote something? It says that God wrote the tablets on the mountain when Moses went up. But you remember he also wrote on the wall that night where Belshazzar was feasting uh, with his lords and his ladies. God spoke uh, through Jonah and that remarkable event. <clears throat> 
of Jonah being thrown overboard and swallowed by the great fish. Ezekiel, God told him to cut his hair and divide it into three portions and throw it to the wind because he wanted to bring things to the attention of Jews. Hosea had a terrible marriage and God used that as an illustration of his relationship with his people. Jeremiah, he was told to eat the scroll that he'd just written on. And so we could go on thinking about the unique ways in which God spoke to his people uh, through the prophets. He says that he's spoken from creation in many and varied ways. And then he goes on to say in those opening verses that he was the, the there at the beginning, he was the creator of things. Revelation says he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, as verse 2 says here. He was there at the beginning. When he was there, it was through his word that the universe was created. He created the world. And it will be at his command that it ends, not David Attenborough's or Greta Thunberg. The Lord is in control. But Jesus is not simply the messenger from God. He is the message. That's why he is superior. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, there is salvation in no other, uh, no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which you must be saved. No prophet, no angel, or heavenly being, only through the Son. So the great finale of the orchestra, the symphony is unfolded. Jesus is greater than the message of the prophets. He is the fulfillment. He's greater than the angels, he goes on to say. History is full of those who claim to be the greatest. Albert Einstein gets a lot of credit. Bill Gates. And recently we had, didn't we, in the last 18 months or so, uh, who was the most famous Briton? Well, we can only answer that question, can't we, out of our own knowledge and experience and uh, uh, the, the, the answer on that occasion was, was Winston Churchill. But even, even the disciples who were work with the Lord in Luke 22, they argued about who was the greatest. So it's always a, uh, uh, it's always a great point. Who is the greatest? And so here in these next few verses, verses 4 to 14, in this chapter, the writer is comparing and contrasting Jesus to the greatest of his created beings, the angels. Now, in these verses, verses 5 through to 13, there are seven references to other scriptures in the Old Testament. We haven't time to look through them all but uh, in verse 5 he's quoting from Psalm 2 Christ is uniquely the son of God no angels could ever claim to be the son of God he also quotes from Samuel that uh, he says he shall be called the son of the most high Frederick Oakley wrote that wonderful Christmas carol. O come all ye faithful, son of the father, begotten 
not created. Quotes from Deuteronomy, where Christ is the focus of our worship in verse 6. And uh, it reminds me of that wonderful hymn by William Fullerton. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship should set his love upon the sons of men. That's got a, a, a special place in, in our hearts. It was my wife's father came to know the Lord through William Fullerton at Keswick, who had written that hymn. And so he goes on in these verses, he quotes from Psalm 10 and from Psalm 45 and from Psalm 110 too. So the writer sums up the superiority of Christ where he began in verse 13 and he says that Christ is on the throne. Of course on May 6th, you must remember May 6th, it's an important day. It's my birthday. But the king is going to be crowned on May the 6th. There'll be one king and one throne. And so it's ever been. There is one throne. And Christ is superior to the angels. In chapter 3, he goes on to say that Christ is greater than Moses. Now we must read this in its context. Moses, of course, was revered and recognised as a great man of God. In fact, there's a passage of scripture which says that there arose not a prophet in all Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Moses was called to lead Israel into the promised land for an earthly inheritance. But Christ was called as out of the world into a heavenly inheritance. I repeat that. Moses called to lead the people of Israel into the promised land uh, for an earthly inheritance. And how superior is the call of God through Christ out of this world into a heavenly inheritance. But how does he do this? The writer says, so to speak, hey, stop for a moment. Fix your eyes on Jesus. That's the text. Chapter 3, verse 1. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I hope that our thoughts today will encourage us to stop in the busyness of life and reflect on the Lord Jesus in all his glory. I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey and how much time you spend each day in the scriptures. It's not for me to dictate. But I know how busy life can get. I know how many things crowd in upon us that demand our time. We need to fix our eyes and spend time with the Lord. Having shown that he's greater than the prophets and the angels, he now directs our attention to Moses. And in what ways was superior to Moses? Well, firstly, and we would have to read the verses and, 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 and we don't have time, but Moses is referred to as a member of God's house, a member of God's family, God's people. But it tells us in Hebrews 3 and chapters, verses 3 and 4, that Jesus is the builder of the house. He has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just much as the builder of the house has more honour than the house. And secondly, Moses uh, was a, a, a servant amongst the people. But Christ is superior to Moses. 
as he is the ruler of the house, as a son, not simply as a servant. He goes on then and he, he says that the, the, the Lord Christ is greater than Aaron. And before giving the believers a final reminder, he warns them in, in, in uh, chapter 3, verses 4 through to, to, to 13, you'll see it headed in your Bibles, not to harden their hearts and sin as Israel did in the wilderness and lose the blessings of peace and rest in Christ. So finally, we're reminded that Christ is superior to the prophets. He's superior to the angels. He's superior to Moses, but he's also superior to Aaron. Now, it doesn't need me to tell you that Aaron was the great high priest. It tells us in chapter 5 and verse 4 that he was called by God. But in chapter 3 for our text... It says, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest, whom we confess. An apostle, we were studying uh, only this last week in our, in our Zoom Bible studies, we were, we were talking about apostleship. And an apostle is one who communicates God's message to the people. The high priest is the one who presented the needs of Israel to God. One was God to man, the other was man to God. Now how was Jesus superior to Aaron? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll have to go through it quickly, we don't have time. He was sinless, unlike Aaron. <coughs> Aaron was sinful, wasn't he? And at one point he failed and he led the people of Israel astray. Chapter 4, verse 15. Christ was both priest and king. He was like, and, and, and there's a whole chapter, isn't there, in Hebrews about Melchizedek. How Melchizedek... Uh, a unique character in the Bible, Melchizedek. It almost seems as if he's timeless, but he was both a priest and a king. And it says in chapter 7 here of Hebrews that it was everlasting kingdom. Uh, the ministry of Aaron, or the ministry of Christ Jesus, was based on a better covenant than that of Aaron. It was a new covenant, a new agreement. But Christ was not only the offerer of the sacrifice, he was the sacrifice himself. And so having laid out all the arguments and shown the superiority of Christ, the fulfilment of the old covenant, superior to the prophets, the angel, Moses and Aaron. He encourages them, as was his original purpose, to persevere in this mortal life. How does he do this? Well, we, we read those verses in chapter 10. And uh, <clears throat> there's a message there, isn't there? Uh, all, all, all by itself. He says three things. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Just of late, as I've been having my own uh, daily quiet time with the Lord, that verse has come to me time and time again in the last few weeks. That if we drop from James, if we draw near unto God, he will draw near unto us. We need to claim that promise when we come into the Lord's presence. 
and know that he draws near to us. And then he says, let us hold on swervingly to the hope that we possess. <clears throat> I was out preaching recent, well, fairly recently. I was brought to task after the service for saying that we had a hope that was greater than the Muslims. Oh, they said, you can't say that. So I said, but, but our Muslim friends and neighbours, they don't have a hope. They don't have a hope. There's no certainty in what they believe. And uh, yesterday, it was quite a remarkable day for me yesterday. Um, I was invited to a very large 60th birthday party. I'd be embarrassed to tell you where it was held, but it was a very, very posh affair. There were 30 people gathered, and uh, I was quite concerned about it. <clears throat> it was my Iranian neighbour who was 60. And uh, I knew some of the people were going, but a vast number of them I didn't know. I wasn't sure whether I really wanted to go anyway. And I made it a matter of prayer that the Lord would both give me words to speak and help me as I mix with this great group of people from all over. There was a lady from Azerbaijan, there was another lady from Switzerland, there were several from Iran, it was an Iranian family. I ended up being seated between two ladies. Would you believe it? They were vibrant Christian women who had been born and brought up as Muslims. Some of our friends here know one of them. But the lady on my other side was equally vibrant in her faith. And when she knew that I was a believer, she almost became excited. Now, why am I telling you this? Because the next person along, next but one to me, was a man from Iceland. And I began to talk to him. And he was making a film. He was a film director in Iceland that was making a film about the church. So we quickly got on to spiritual things. And he told me that um, as a young man he had a faith, but that he was now an agnostic. The point being was this enabled me to give my testimony. I was able to say to him that as a young lad, I had put my faith in Christ Jesus. Why? And I now have a hope. I have a hope that the things of this world will pass away. We shall be changed and we shall be made into the likeness of our glorious Lord. My readings for Advent were a book by Tim Chester that was called Fixated. And in, it, in, in this book, it's just a reading each day for a few weeks before Christmas. He encourages us to keep and to fix our minds on the Lord Jesus. I believe that one of the greatest weapons that the devil has these days is distraction. And by that, I mean that he causes us to do legitimate things, not things that are wrong, legitimate things that distract us from the word of God and from ways of the Lord. And I'll be honest with you and say I've been subject to that in recent weeks. 
because I've found an author at the library that I like to read. And I've read five of his books in the last five weeks. But I've also recognised, I read one of them and I took it back. I was not prepared to continue. Firstly, because it was leading me into thoughts I didn't want. But it was a distraction. The devil wants to distract us from the things of Christ. Isn't that the exact point of Hebrews 3, chapter 1? The Hebrew believers were challenged. They were persecuted for their faith. And he didn't want them to be distracted by the opposition, but should keep their thoughts and minds focused on Christ Jesus in all his glory. Paul, writing to the believers in Rome, put it another way. He said, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. May the Lord enable us to do the same. Amen.